gentlemen, my name is Linda Lees. I am the head of programming for TAFAF New York. Welcome, happy to see you. There's sunshine, so that's, <laughs> that's a very good sign. Um, we have an outstanding panel today to talk on a subject that I think we all think about, uh, many people think about but don't talk about, and that's in a sense how the idea for this panel came about. Before we begin, I just want to say a quick word about TAFAF Coffee Talks and the idea behind it, which is, uh, as we started in the fall, to know that every day during the run of the fair, uh, you can come to this space at 1030 and find a conversation and dialogue and uh, uh, provocation even in some cases uh, about topics that we believe are worthy of your time and attention. So we're very happy to have you here this morning. I hope you will take your cultural brochure with you. And uh, there's still two more coffee talks tomorrow on surrealism and the day after that on creating magic, art, fashion, and performance. So please do come back. Uh, I'm now going to introduce our illustrious moderator, Mark Pachter, Director Emeritus of the National Portrait Gallery, Smithsonian Institution. So, <laughs> Um, it, the choice was the illustrious moderator rather than the other one whom we've sent out of the room. Uh, well, uh, really we might call this, why are we here? And that's not about the coffee talk, it's about the phenomenon of the uh, art fair, which uh, I don't even have to say in our lifetime, in the last decade, has exploded as a phenomenon in the art world. And um, I think uh, I want to salute a few people before we, we launch into the panel. One is Linda for coming up with the idea of Coffee Talks, which has really um, broadened the experience that you can have at this remarkable fair in TFAF. Secondly, um, and I'll introduce him more formally in a second, uh, Glenn, uh, who is our uh, godfather of this panel. I think that's a fair way to put it. Um, and who must himself be provocative because it's really, it's a provocative concept to actually challenge, uh, not only celebrate as well, but challenge the notion of what is an art fair and is it an entirely a good thing uh, for uh, the word in the description, the, the stakeholders, which is not only of course the artist and the dealers and so forth, but all of you um, who come to these and uh, whose notion of art actually may be, in, and design more broadly, the whole category, uh, may actually be more and more affected by the experience in these contexts. So we thought it'd be a good idea to examine that. Um, my job, principally, is, uh, is as timekeeper, because really we must all be out by 11.30, because this magically transforms into from a, uh, a place of intellectual revelry to a place of gastronomic revelry. So uh, we, need, we need to be out by 11.30. I only say that as an advance um, uh, apology for stopping you because you will have time. One of the time issues is that there's enough time for questions from the audience. But if I stop you in the middle of your most profound inquiry, no, it's because we really have to be out at 11.30. I'll make sure there is time for everything. Now, let me introduce our panel. Uh, Glenn Adamson um, is uh, currently senior scholar at the Yale Center for British Art and editor at large of the magazine Antiques. Um, he is uh, self-described as a curator and theorist, uh, which suggests that they're not always the same thing, and I think that's probably true, uh, who works uh, in design, craft, and contemporary art. Until March uh, 2016, not so long ago, he was the director of the Museum of Arts and Design here in New York. Uh, it goes on and on, of course, but I don't have the time to give you all the, all the uh, remarkable um, things that our panel has done. Sarah Archer is a writer and curator based in Philadelphia whose work appears in Hyperallergic. By the way, if you don't go to Hyperallergic, uh, you only partially qualify as a, a lover of art in, in this area. So please uh, do. Her reviews and articles have appeared in New Yorker Online, Washington Post, Slate, uh, modern magazine, um, and she is the author of a number of things, but the one I, I choose 
to feature is Mid-Century Christmas, a book on Christmas and modernism during the Cold War, which is such a great topic. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I will. Uh, I will. Uh, thank you. Um, Freya Hartzell is Assistant Professor of Modern Design History at the Bard Graduate Center uh, in New York. Uh, her focus is European art, design, and architecture from 1750 through 1950, which pretty much covers the waterfront um, in terms uh, of, uh, of the, the effects on, on the modern world. I, this is her sentence. I love it. She, I, uh, is especially interested in empathy, materiality, and cultural politics as understood through designed objects. Um, which I think is wonderful, particularly the use of the word empathy uh, in that. Uh, <laughs> I congratulate you on your self-description. And um, James Demetis, who said at the end, he has marked his first year as curator and director of museum relations at r &D Company in New York. He specializes in historical design and builds partnerships for the firm. Um, also self-described, but well, I think he, this position represents a new chapter in a career that has been mostly spent in the trenches of the auction market. Uh, trenches is obviously the operative word there. Uh, from 2003 to 2013, James was the senior vice president at Sotheby's, where he curated, edited, and produced over 50 auctions and catalogs of 20th and 21st century design. That's all I will say again of a rather, uh, about a rather rich career. Our, our format is that I'm gonna ask each of the panelists in alphabetical order, you know who you are alphabetically, um, to uh, give a, broadly a five minute statement in which, in best case, both the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of the art fair, disadvantage may even be a strong word, just the challenges um, of the art fair um, are described from their perspective, then I'll give the panel uh, time to react to what their fellow panelists have said, and then, of course, uh, the floor will be yours. So with that, Glenn. Okay, thank you, Mark, and thank, thank you all for coming uh, this early morning in a very busy week. Uh, I'm gonna restrict my comments to just a few, and insofar as I was involved very heavily with Linda Lees in organizing the panel and indeed uh, suggesting the other panelists, I feel like in a way that is my contribution uh, in a sense, but I also thought that given that, I would just frame the question rather than necessarily advance any answers to it at this point. So the question, which of course is prompted by the title fair or unfair, is whether art fairs are a good or a bad thing. And obviously they're probably both. So in what sense are they positive and in what sense are they negative impacts on the many constituents or stakeholders of the art world. And um, I was entertained by the fact that you introduced me as the godfather of the panel, which suggests the thought that the art fair is an offer we have not been able to refuse. <laughs> and it's, it's, um, it's something that I might compare uh, in its relationship to art practice. I might compare the art fair to the effect of social media on our political system. So social media is obviously not generated by the arena of political practice. It was not invented by politicians or governments, but it has obviously had an absolutely dramatic impact on the way that politics is conducted uh, worldwide. And that probably has been both good in the sense of democratizing access and awareness, and also bad in the sense that it has arguably made our political discourse much more superficial, much more twitchy, uh, and also has transformed what was largely conducted behind doors, considered, and then presented in a moment of focus and consideration. It has transformed that process into something that's carried out in public, live, uh, in a very quick and probably very unconsidered way. Um, and that indeed could be said to be true of the art fair as well. Art used to be presented in ways that were highly staged and considered by museums, of course, but also by commercial galleries, which is really what we're talking about mainly here, um, and even in auction houses, all of which are venues in which the presentation of art is curated and is, um, is put forth in a manner that is manifestly and hopefully deeply connected to an ongoing intellectual program, 
one that is very firmly anchored to place. So when you go to a gallery, let's say Matthew Marks or David Zwerner, you kind of know what you're going to get. And the building itself tends to reinforce uh, aesthetically and um, you might say uh, programmatically or ideologically even, reinforce the artistic program that you're going to find in that place. Um, the art fair, by contrast, obviously is a transient event and a peripatetic one that shifts in terms of its architectural personality. TFF is a great example, something being uprooted from Maastricht and then brought here into an armory building that is also used for many other art fairs that most people who attend this one will be familiar with. And so what this does is to dislodge our relationship to place from our relationship to the art that's placed on view. And it also radically erodes the curatorial premise in which art is presented. And I suppose depending on how you feel about curating itself, you might think of that as a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe it's good that art is left to fight for itself in the wilds without the apparatus of intellectuals like me to help make a case for it, but maybe it's extremely corrosive and long-term will be very debilitating for any of the art world's uh, claims about its own validity. And I will say that I slightly incline to the later, latter view, which is why I propose this as the subject for the morning panel, but I'm gonna leave it there for now. Clearly you've thought about this not at all. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's Sarah. Uh, we're, we're going alphabetically. Oh, we're going alphabetically. Um, I, I, I um, agree with some of that, not all. Um, and I was thinking about it mostly from the point of view of somebody who, some, who writes about art and design uh, pretty regularly and criticizes things, um, enjoys criticizing things and writing about it critically, and has actually written reviews of art fairs in the past, uh, which is, a, when you really think about it, a very, very strange um, kind of undertaking because it has certain superficial similarities, an art fair does, to a gallery exhibition or a museum exhibition. Um, art is being presented to you in a place, it's, that's, and that's more or less where it ends because the goals and kind of authorship of the, the endeavors are totally different. Um, you can't evaluate an art fair as a cohesive entity um, with an eye toward kind of coherent authorship or vision. It, it would make no sense to do, to do that. They all have their own kind of aesthetic points of view. There are others, obviously, the kind of young, hip, and groovy, kind of scrappier art fairs. There's the more posh, and I think we're a little bit, we're pretty far on the posh we're end of the spectrum. We're deep here, into here posh. Today, it's a wonderful deep thing. into posh, yes. Deep posh, and that's obviously, that's clear and evident and, and lovely. Um, but how do you critique that? It sort of short circuits all of the normal um, mm -hmm. tools that you have as a critic, I would say, right. to try to evaluate it. So. Is it good for the artists? In this case, a lot of the artists and designers are no longer with us, so it may be just fine, but it doesn't really matter. Um, are the sponsors happy? It sort of raises all these other questions. You know, who is it a success means something totally different. Um, so I think hmm. it's also, uh, you feel kind of oddly irrelevant as a critic because basically um, the galleries, I, I did a short stint working at a commercial gallery, so I got a little bit of a bird's eye view into this process kind of going from Google SketchUp all the way to you know, sales and shipping. Um, there are certain architectural and spatial limitations to this. So certain pieces, certain scale of pieces work and certain ones don't. And that's one of the reasons why it's, I say this not as a qualitative comparison, but it's kind of like the vignettes in Ikea. Like it's just kind of one sort of as if living room after another, after another, <laughs> after another. And they're all roughly uh, kind of sympathetic in scale, right? It's a, the kind of um, totally different styles, but they're all, you know, kind of, uh, arranged just so, as that you could kind of imagine yourself, you know, suddenly being able to afford E.W. Godwin furniture or something like that. So it's <laughs> immersive in a way that kind of invites you to think of it as a living space. Um, so I think in a way that's, as an art critic with a capital A, there's something that's, that's off about it. But it also, if you're a cultural critic, is kind of fascinating because it gives you a bird's eye view into um, a terribly elite world and kind of a, a, an elite way of shopping that, you know, for most of us is a spectator sport, um, and to kind of consider uh, what that means for the way that people, the most powerful people in the world consume. Um, so is that good or bad? I actually don't know. I think it may be kind of depressing, but it may not necessarily be bad. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I will turn it over to yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's that's actually kind of great for, for some of what I want to say. So I'm a, I'm a historian, and in the interest of heterogeneity of this panel, I'm going to actually read you a little story that I wrote as a historian. So I write and teach the history of art and design, and I very seldom go to art fairs. 
I arrived here yesterday afternoon in a sea of dripping umbrellas, and it felt really good to get out of the rain. And it felt even better to step into the exhibition spaces with their carefully orchestrated ensembles of warm lighting, sensuous textiles, and their breathtaking array of incredibly precious, yet to me incredibly familiar things, many of them at least. In other words, it had been worth waiting for the Crosstown bus in a downpour. After looking at many displays of important paintings and sculptures, I began to encounter some utilitarian things, AKA design objects. And what struck me right away was that in contrast to the so-called fine art that I'd just been looking at, many of these design pieces weren't actually labeled. Um, after visiting several design gallery booths, I asked one of the attendants why this was the case, and she said, it's a personal choice. We felt it would inhibit people's experience, in other words, to have labels. It's more intimate this way. We do have checklists, and people can always ask. Though, of course, I did find as I visited more booths that um, many design pieces were indeed labeled. I found the use of the word intimate very telling here. Intimate is hardly the word I choose to describe my experience of this fair, or even my experience of that particular booth. While everyone is encouraged to look, and certainly to do more than look, no one here is really encouraged to make themselves at home. So this question of intimacy became the focus of my experience yesterday. How would my students feel, I wondered, looking at these displays? In some ways, their experience would be intimate. It would be materially intimate. For academics who generally work with museum collections and from day to day work mainly with images, the warmth, the touch, the material presence, that combination of optic and haptic qualities that constitutes each design piece is an important reminder of what our work is all about. To be able to sort of fraternize, to sort of rub elbows with so many different yet important pieces of design in a single venue feels like a luxury. And of course it is. Certainly none of my students could afford the price of admission here. And perhaps luxuriating in design is one of its points. That intimate, sensuous feeling of living with, or imagining, for a few moments at least, living with beautifully designed things without the burden of knowing their history or their price is luxuriant. As I was leaving the fair, I came across an exquisite Berlin ironwork bracelet dating from around 1810, which I wanted a lot. Um, this is a type of jewelry that's really important to the history of design, both for its fabrication from what in its day um, was a radically modern and decidedly unfashionable material for jewelry and for its political significance as an emblem of allegiance to Prussia's fight against Napoleon. Though I've both written about and lectured on Berlin iron jewelry, before yesterday I'd never actually touched any. The juxtaposition of my historical understanding of this map black industrial material, a material that would later become the stuff of 19th century railway stations, department stores, and exhibition halls, with its delicate feather-like presence in the palm of my hand was for me in that moment astonishing and transformative. As I gently handed it back to the gallerist, she said, it's so nice to talk with someone who really knows what this is. Today, I find I'm still considering what that really means. And that's what I have to say. Charming. Well, uh, you're used to being the last with your, your, your name, so. George well, first of all, Freya brought up two points that I want to quickly address that are just, I think, the essence of what makes me still a huge um, advocate of the existence of these fairs. First of all, um, well, actually, one of them is not even, is, is, which is a criticism, which is something that does need to be addressed, and that is, design galleries and decorative art galleries do need to continue to add more labels to their booths. Um, it is something that is very true um, in that there's a certain kind of, you know, absence of, of intellect uh, on the printed word in many design galleries compared to the kind of constant long time standards of what the contemporary and modern art galleries do there. But then second of all, the most important thing about fairs like this is that ability to touch. And it's, it's exactly um, similar to what you can do when you go to the viewing at Sotheby's or Christie's or Phillips mm -hmm. in the design market. And it's something that, um, as someone who has spent most of my, my career in the trenches selling stuff, being deeply involved in the market and not worrying at all about social issues or criticism or anything like that, um, 
it's, it's the most remarkable thing to see people visit and realize that, yes, that Rateau chair that's in DiLorenzo's booth might be 1.5 to $2 million from the Blumenthal Pavilion, but you can sit in it, you can look at it, you can touch it, you can feel it, and you can't do that when you go to the Met. And you can't do that when you're looking at it on the screen at the BGC. It's a really important thing. Um, so moving on from that, I will say that the, for the design, we keep talking about art fairs. And it is true, with the exception of a, a few smaller satellite fairs like Design Miami Basel, that's what this is. This is an art fair where the design galleries are absolutely, in every sense of the word, the second-class citizens. And the design market in general is, contrary to what you may read about, not a strong market. Um, there was hope about 15 to 16 years ago that the design market would march in lockstep with the contemporary art market. That simply has not happened. And it's been, the design market has been flattened out by a wide variety of things. Um, most importantly, um, the internet, social media, um, reproductions, reissues, uh, selling on Instagram, um, all of these issues which has sort of made things ubiquitous and has led to the fact that, by and large, um, the better design galleries are selling the vast majority of their material not to collectors, but to interior designers who are putting together environments for contemporary art collectors. And so what I love about a fair like TFAF is that it's the one place where there is some hope for connoisseurship and where galleries such as, and now we're not in this fair, we're over at Collective, but where if we were in this fair, and we would probably love to be in this fair next year, um, where we desperately search for the collector. And yes, the material here is far beyond what most folks can afford, most academics, most you know, enthusiasts, people that follow Instagram and, and, and like you know, pieces of Prouvé furniture online that way. That said, you can collect just about anything. This is the higher end version of it, and we're just searching for people who actually, who are in the upper rent district who will actually collect again, because it's just not happening. All interesting comments and amazingly diverse, although there's still a slight undertone of hostility toward the art for, we'll, we'll tease that out more. Um, let me just make a few comments before inviting um, uh, comments again of each statement by the other panelists. Um, and it's going to be from my experience as having been a museum professional, and now I'm just out there wandering uh, and loving what I'm seeing, but without any particular purchase in mind. Uh, first of all, when you go as most of us do, um, there is still the fantasy of possession. And even though we can't actually do it, I mean, you described your fantasy pretty well. With the, um, I think that's actually a wonderful thing. And one of the things that fairs do is provoke the imagination. You can begin to imagine yourself in that room with that object. And I think that that's less true at galleries uh, and most museums. So that's a good thing for me. I, I continue to love um, being in these places even when I'm not actually buying. Uh, the second thing, which is possibly related, is what it teases out of the quiet world that most of us never see. I mean, what doesn't yet get into museums, or what will go into private and came out of private rooms. Uh, so this, this revelation of what's there, usually owned by the very rich, but not always, by the way, uh, is a very active thing that happens. Galleries, of course, do this too, but collectively, it's amazing. The third, third thing I would say, so I'm being mostly positive about this experience because I'm quite, a, quite excited as a consumer of them uh, now. Um, the third, uh, just to borrow from popular culture, I think it's Brigadoon. It's Brigadoon. And, um, and, and more and more with multiple fairs happening in, in an environment, and. I hope all of you are wandering too. Your loyalty, of course, must be to TFAF, but as you wander about as well, um, 
you collectively begin to get a sense of excitement of the possibilities, uh, of the comparisons that happen. I mean, from my point of view, modern design is collapsing if you go to one fair here um, compared to what one sees otherwise, but that's just me. Uh, I, I can do that. And by the way, while we think of fairs primarily in terms of the visual arts in, in all their rich variety, um, remember that the idea of this kind of experience actually is quite old in the performing arts world. Um, and actually the first idea of Brigadoon appropriately enough happened to me in Edinburgh, uh, which I love going to in August, the Edinburgh Festival, which is this takeover of a place by a form that I adore. So um, let's keep that in mind as well. Now, having had my say, uh, you've all said something. Do you want to respond? You have a bit already, but respond to observations made by your fellow panelists, and then you'll have a chance. No? Well, I have, I mean, I have one thing that is a, is a huge topic, I think, and, and maybe one that we can't, you know, we can't as a panel really address, but I think the, Part of part of the subtext of, of my thinking here, and something that just came up, is this question of an art design divide, mm, okay. um, which which kind of struck me yesterday. Um, it's not something that I think about a lot, actually, because I think in um, in academia, it's it's not so much of a topic anymore. Um, but here, it's a topic for sure. Um, and just, I think that for me, the moment of thinking about this question of labeling and context, um, you know, if uh, when we look at um, Picasso ceramics, which happened to be something that I can't abide, um, but, <laughs> but we all have a sense of what that means and what that is and the label tell, okay, we know it's Picasso and we have that story almost without knowing very much about that. Um, and, and then if we look at these design pieces without context, we don't necessarily have so much of a story. And I think um, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily entirely about that question of contextualizing, but also about this question of like, we're just supposed to intuit that there's a, that there's a hierarchical or um, certainly there is a functional difference. But in many ways, I think at this fair, the, there's not so much of a functional difference because for instance, if we're seeing Yosa Hoffman dining room set and Egon Schiele drawings, in a way that's all, that's all an aesthetic whole. That's, it's, you know, we're looking at those things in the same way. Those design objects are part of that, um, part of that aesthetic experience. So I'm, I'm curious if anyone has thoughts about that. Yeah, um, this sort of gets to the question of what the scenography of an art fair is good at and bad at. Mm -hmm. So I maybe overstated, intentionally overstated, the degree to which the art is left to fend for itself in an art fair environment. And in fact, as you can see from this fair particularly, where I think there's a lot of capital being brought to bear by the various galleries, the settings are actually quite ambitious, given the fact that they are temporary and there will be no money recouped from any of the physical installation. So you look at a gallery like Dickinson upstairs, for example, and the kind of recreation of this almost just style environment in order to create a, the proper setting for, the, for those objects. And there are several other examples of that. Um, also true over at Collective, occasionally true at Freeze, this week here in, in town. Uh, very rarely true at the lower level art fairs. Lower level, as you said, Sarah, they're quite, uh, um, quite explicitly placed in, in a kind of hierarchy. But what the scenography, so what this, that scenography is good at, I think is exactly what James pointed to, which is that this is essentially an event that's about interior decor, hmm. particularly as it implies to design. And usually there is a middle person, a uh, middle man, middle woman, who is acting as the liaison. Yeah. And if it's not a, a, a designer, it might be an art advisor also who would be involved. Um, but even it's, if it's the direct consumer, I think there's a very strong and intense um, tendency for the fair to present itself as, uh, I think both you and, and Freya and you, Sarah, said, as a kind of domestic environment in miniature, a simulacrum, which interestingly enough goes back all the way to the early 20th century in the way that modern design was first presented to the public as in the Metropolitan's, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, model rooms, and there are many other examples of that. Um, so what you get is the look, generally speaking, but what you don't get is precisely the story. There's not a very strong sense of narrative. There's not a very strong sense of historical context in an art fair, 
precisely because of the speed, which gets back to the, the point I made earlier about Twitter being the kind of analogous phenomenon out there online. And I guess I would, um, just to flesh in some of my own reservations a little bit, I think that although, again, there is a sense of availability and you know, touching the Berlin work bracelet, bracelet would be a great example of that, or if you could bring your students here, having them have the chance to look at so much material quickly, maybe test their eye, think about how much they actually know and don't know about this material. So there is that sense of availability, but what you don't necessarily get is the um, other dimensions of relationships that you can have with this historical material besides do I like the way that it looks and do I want it? which I take your point, Mark, that that's kind of nice. But to me, if that's the way that art is being democratized in explicitly in terms of possession and immediate uninformed aesthetic response, then that cannot be a good thing. You know, you're, you're um, putting it in the context of social media, and uh, not only social media, I would say the net in general, um, suggests the larger problem of authority, yeah. period and that our age rejoices in accessibility. Mm -hmm. uh, we can learn a lot, we can go randomly, we can browse, which is a good library word that might actually apply to fairs. Mm -hmm. um, but that what we are missing in our time is some way to evaluate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's actually often presented as a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, is, that's the dystopian part of your your vision I embrace. It's also just very interesting to see powerful galleries try to maintain their air of authority in a situation this haphazard. I think that's one of the great spectator sports of the art. Right, well said. And I would, I would uh, say, go ahead. you hit the nail on the head there because remember, when you go upstairs into Dickinson's gallery and look at the Dutch modernists that are on the walls and the, and the aura that they're trying to create, remember when you look, and they actually priced their paintings, which was also a nice thing, not every gallery yes. does that. When they sell a $3 million painting, and they have multiple $3 million paintings on the walls there, they're probably pocketing about a half a million dollars in profit, which easily you know, takes care of all the expenses. The design galleries do not have that opportunity. You know, that is you know, far more than the entire value of the booth of Dance Mobile Kunst, which is one of the greatest Danish design galleries in the world, and has a very elegant booth here. And it goes back to something that Glenn also said in his opening remarks when he talks about how you know what you're in for when you go to see a Zwerner or a Gagosian's gallery spaces here in New York. It's really important to remember that of the design galleries that are here exhibiting, there's a handful of them that don't actually even have galleries anymore. This is their opportunity right. to curate and present something. Second of all, there's another group of galleries here um, who s struggle immensely uh, to keep up in the New York real estate market and have had to move their galleries over and over again. This at the same time that you read about the Zwerners of the world opening like their 19th gallery, you know? And so the haves and the have-nots, you know, our gallery is one of the few galleries that has sort of like a permanent physical plant where we can actually do shows. And so it, it, this is like the best opportunity for a gallery here to put their best foot forward. Sir? Kind of relating back to what Freya was saying and you were saying about possession as a way of relating mm. to objects. One of the things that I find really fascinating about these booths is desks because many of them have they all more or less have desks. Mm -hmm. Some of them are like a desk with a capital D that you can buy or you're supposed to want to buy. And the other one is kind of the desk where the you know, posh young woman sits and kind of you know, adds your email to the email list. And it's kind of hard to tell. And I think looking at the booths as a workspace in a way is like really fascinating. And that kind of relates back to, is this design at, with a capital D as window dressing for works of fine art? And that's this kind of tiresome dichotomy that we encounter in the marketplace. But um, or are they being presented as you know, an object that you can use? Or is it some, I, there's something about um, the use of furniture in this kind of temporary workspace that's kind of, I don't know, I hate to use the word disruptive because it's so sort of eBay, but it's, it's I don't know, there was something, I was thinking a lot about that. Well, if I just, it, one of the funny things that you bring up about that is that when I talk about the lack of true collectors out there, one of the most loyal fan bases for collecting design are the contemporary art dealers themselves. And so 
first of all, they have the money to be able to collect design uh, in addition to what they're doing, you know, professionally. And so, yes, you will see little token representations of their taste. Um, and in many fairs, that, that material is only supposed to be a prop, but it will be a perfectly wonderful period prouvé desk. And it also probably is for sale if you really push them for it and do it behind the scenes. <laughs> you just have to ask and they'll tell you no, but then if you keep persisting, you know. The, yeah, uh, I mean, I think, oh, I'm uh, just, I was gonna say, Please. I think the word, that, the word that comes to mind for me is accessory, right? I mean, and that's, and I don't even know how I feel about that. It's not necessarily that that's, I mean, in many ways, I'm not, I would not advocate, um, and this is completely, because I don't think about the market. So this is like, I just disclosed that. Like, I should leave now. But, but um, you know, the idea of design as something utilitarian, I mean, we need a desk, right? They need a desk. They need a chair. They, you know. And then, of course, there are booths that say, please do not sit on the sofa. You know? so, so there's that, too, which, which operates in a number of ways. I mean, maybe you really don't sit on the sofa because it's about to fall apart. Or maybe, you know, you don't sit on the sofa because we want to encourage you to think of it as a piece of art. And don't sit on it. But I think this idea of design as accessory is maybe not, it's not all bad, right? I mean, it, design is accessory. Uh, the uh, godfather wants to say something. The godfather wants to say something. Yeah, so this gets back to a point that James made earlier about the uh, useful hybridization that happens in a fair like TFAF where you have people who are coming from the Picasso, for the Picassos, but maybe they even find out about Prouvé for the first time, absolutely, who knows? Absolutely. So that, uh, that clearly is a positive thing that we should note. Um, I did, did want to just um, maybe say something explicit about the secondary effects of the art fair, because that's something that was very much in my mind as we were preparing for this panel, and the reason that we invited a historian, a critic, and a gallerist to be part of the panel, rather than people who actually make art fairs happen, is because we wanted to lay stress on the indirect effects of the art fair. So James, for example, already mentioned the fact that it's become harder for galleries to sustain themselves in real estate, bricks and mortar. And of course, one of the reasons for that is that so much of the commerce is happening in the art fair, and the very fact that it's possible for a gallery to exist without existing physically is enabled by the art fair, but that goes both ways too, because if the art fair didn't exist, it would be that much more important to have bricks and mortar, and therefore more resource would be going towards that, and therefore you would have more continuity in terms of actual gallery physical plant. And um, less discussed, but I think also super relevant, is what, um, is what Sarah said about criticism as applied to the art fair. In other words, it doesn't really apply. And Sarah had pointed us um, during our preparatory conversations for this panel to an absolutely terrific essay by Barry Schwabsky, which was published in The Nation back in 2012. And he sort of tried to write a critical assessment of Freeze while recognizing that effectively this was impossible in any way it didn't matter what he said. So unlike Diderot writing about the salon back in the 18th century where even a year later people would live and die by what he said about their paintings, you know, Fries doesn't care what a critic says. Criti critics are way too slow. How can they possibly come to grips with it as an no. overall phenomenon? No. Anywhere there's no curatorial proposition being made by most of the galleries in the first place, so what's the critic supposed to even write about? So it's like criticism slides off. Mm -hmm. And then the historian, it's maybe the hardest thing to figure out because it's so delayed, you know, but I think that insofar as the gallery as an engine of historical meaning making and then the critic as a kind of live record that a historian will go back to um, is concerned, it does seem to me that over time, the relationship between art and art history is in some way that I can't quite pin down, imperiled by the art fair phenomenon. And obviously we don't know what that's gonna look like in 20 years, but it may well be that art historians of the future, when called upon to write about the decade and more following the millennium, and they, art historians in 2050, when they talk about our period, they may not actually talk about art. They might talk about art fairs. Right, as the thing that was happening. That was the important phenomenon. It wasn't being led by artists anymore. Artists were only making product. All the transformative effects were being created by art fairs, by fabrication firms, et cetera, et cetera. And how should we feel about that? Uh, I'm just about to open uh, to our, our guests uh, to ask questions. I, I would just uh, take the privilege of chair to say a few things because I worry about my laments. We all have laments about various things, some of them just because of 
what we remember with fondness from our own youth and some because they're real losses to society. Um, and the, 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 the fear of the absence of the physical gallery, I haven't quite decided whether it's part of the lament in me for the loss of the art house and film and the independent bookseller whether it's all about that, um, and that's either nostalgic or a real loss. Um, the, the, other, the, the other side of it is that the physical space and the visiting over a long time in one place is, by the way, happening up and down Third Avenue in every category of object. Um, storefronts are emptying out. So there's a, there's a broader notion of how we do ac actually access things and needs and, and ideas, uh, whether it's fluid, temporary, global, or local, specific, and regular. So again, it's, it's part of, I think, that larger issue. Let's, uh, let's open to the, um, to the audience. Do you have a question? Please, could you stand? It would be easier for us to see. How do you want to respond to that wonderful, uh, those two great questions? Um, James, maybe. James? Oh, well, in the, obviously there are, let's be clear here, and we're mostly here in the decorative arts world or design world, um, there are significantly more opportunities for fine art fairs than there are design and decorative arts fairs. And so, again, I, I feel that TFAF, um, along with the Winter Antique Show in January is sort of the last gasp of all of decorative arts connoisseurship and collecting. It is the last place. I mean, you go to Winter Antique Show, it's even more pronounced looking at, you know, the decorative arts dealers from America who are the mom and pops who, who have run that fair for many years and most of them are now operating out of their houses. I mean, you, there is just, there are so few decorative arts galleries left you know, in, in uptown. I know, and I, I can't answer that. I mean, I just think, you know, it's, you know, it's such a huge commodity, I, you know. <laughs> you know, the, the one thing I would say, and I'm really pleased to hear from a collector because that's yes. one constituency we don't have represented on the panel, so thank you for the question. The one thing I would point to, just um, because we haven't said it yet, and it is obvious, is that the art fair is an intensely global phenomenon. This obviously comes to us from Maastricht. But what's really significant is that the art fair is expanding, um, depending on your point of view, either like a cancer or like the good word of a religion, um, to very unexpected geographies. So you have art fairs happening in places that have not historically been thought of as centers of art collecting. And of course, they actually do propagate a new culture of art collecting in those places, as well as providing an anchor point for local art scenes in some cases. So I think um, any rigorous assessment of the art fair should take into account that the newness or the, the growth of the field that you're asking about is probably not going to happen in New York City. It's going to happen in Turkey and in Brazil and in Africa. And that might be actually the long-term contribution that the art fair phenomenon has to make is actually loosening 
the stranglehold that a few cities have on the art world itself. Very interesting. Any other responses to that? Let's go on to uh, another question, perhaps. Yes, please. Yes. I'm, uh, I mean, the, the question of these, these, you know, the World's Fairs, for instance, I mean, I'm somebody who works on the 19th century a lot, so I think about the Crystal Palace all the time. <laughs> all my waking hours, I'm thinking about the Crystal Palace. Um, and I think my, my immediate response, um, you know, certainly in the context of this particular fair, but maybe in general, is um, that I think one thing that's very different is the kind of rarification. Um, that's taken place, and I like Sarah's posh to not posh kind of spectrum comment, um, but I think that in a number of the, the you know, the earliest fairs, um, they were they were about a, a incredibly kind of promiscuous mixing of things and experiences, um, from you know from artworks to um, furniture and household products, but things like machinery, and um, you know, wonders of science. And so I think, I think those fairs had a much um, more kind of heterogeneity and, and also a kind of a, um, they're important venues for mixing of class, you know, and mixing of, of, of social types. Um, and, you know, anybody who, who's seen the, you know, the recent, um, uh, the BBC Victoria series on PBS with, you know, Prince Albert sort of getting exciting about the railway. And this is, this is a kind of an amazing, um, you know, especially the 19th century is this amazing period of kind of the aristocracy and the, and the working person coming together and, and all in this venue for that kind of um, exchange. And I think that's, I think that's very different um, in the fairs that we're talking about today. And so that's, I mean, that's one thing that, that I would, and I would say kind of the 20th century version of that, it's, it wasn't, I mean, it was about consumption in the sense of like hot dogs, right? To go to the 1963-64 World's Fair in Queens where you could kind of see like the Eames IBM pavilion, you weren't kind of going there as um, a hugely influential person to like buy the pavilion, right? You were sort of maybe inspired to buy a Selectric typewriter, um, but it was a very middle class, working class attraction. Um, in a way that I don't, I would argue that it sort of doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, maybe it exists online. Um, but I think yes. this is um, sort of the, the sort of creme de la creme of that experience distilled and kind of made, you know, sort of turned into the entirety of the experience. That said, it's funny. I do think that when you leave New York and you go to art fairs in other parts of this country, there's a little bit more opportunity for uh, a mixing of classes and for the fairs to be educational. Um, in we, uh, in America, uh, in Chicago, the big fair in September there, which is out on that um, hilarious pier with the Ferris wheel that goes out into the, uh, the Navy pier. Um, we did that fair, which is 90% art, 10% design, and we were blown away on the weekend by how it was like you were in the Met in terms of the variety of people. And I would also say Miami, and you're, you're familiar with that, Miami, the fairs in December turn into this massive social party scene mixing many more different cultures and classes. New York, this building, not so much. But maybe freeze more so. Um, and I, I wanted to tackle the second part of your question, which I think is also um, a great one, which is what's the impact on the global production of art? Um, and so here I'll cite something that Barry Schwabsky also cited, which is Chuck Close's well-known quip that an artist going to an art fair is like a cow going to an abattoir, a slaughterhouse. And um, you know, the, the thing that an art fair will do for an artist right away is tell them exactly where they stand. And I think that that is really the most salient effect that an art fair has. And as Sarah said, uh, the fairs themselves are registered on this implicit hierarchy. So which gallery you're 
which fair your gallery gets into, and then obviously which gallery you are in. It's just a much more explicit version of the kind of uh, hierarchization that artists have always had to deal with. And I think it's, um, it's sobering for them in my experience. Most artists I know don't like going to art fairs very much, except for maybe the socializing on the, on the opening night. Um, and it does sort them out in a way that's extremely um, unmissable. I think it's appropriate that Glenn gets, got the last word. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much to our panel. Thank you all for coming. I hope you'll come back for the next two coffee talks. I do want to say one thing about comparing this to Edinburgh Festival, and that is, I didn't say it in my introduction, uh, but the idea for this is, uh, for the coffee talks, is something I completely borrowed, the nice word from the Edinburgh Book Festival, which does something similar at 9.30 every morning if anybody who's been at the festival the night before can still get up for. Uh, but to have this more intimate setting to listen to a lot of interesting people talk on interesting topics. So uh, they, I think there is a similarity there. And I would also add to the comment about world fairs, et cetera, the very nature of this um, endeavor of the coffee talks plus our new partnership with the Metropolitan Opera in a way is trying to expand our base as an art fair into the arts uh, more generally and, 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 and intellectual investigation at the same time. So uh, it's a small start, but we're trying to head in that direction to some degree. So again, my great thanks to you. Thanks to our wonderful panel and uh, hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.